Hey folks, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant with you for the afternoon session. Welcome, good to have you along. Hope you had a uh, great weekend. We got a lot of stuff going on here. Again, not one, not two. Okay, let's say two live trials. Uh, don't forget the Eric Boyd matter. The jury now considering that case. They have it. We are in verdict watch. So what we've been doing is in the Florida case of Grant Amato. We are into the penalty phase. It began today. The prosecution putting on their witnesses. We've had the opening statements. This is about the fourth witness today for the prosecution. This is a correctional officer that was somehow supervising or exposed to Grant Amato while he was waiting for trial. Uh, this is a defense witness. Okay, let's go in and listen. Up. Well, that was fascinating. Uh, so what we what we barely caught the tail end of there was uh, this uh, CEO talking about his experience with Mr. Amato while pending trial. And of course, I think what we heard was he was a model prisoner. Uh, so how that reflects on him in terms of the penalty phase, the jury will have to decide how much, if any, weight to give that. Here to help me understand all of this, because the penalty phase in Florida is a, is a trial in and of itself, Gene Rossi is with me, former federal prosecutor for 27 years, 110 plus trials. Gene, only one question for you. How are you still upright after all of that? Well, after an hour with Bob Bianchi, I've recovered <laughs> and I'm now ready to go for round two. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is very typical in Florida. We roll uh, right from the, the guilt phase into the penalty phase. They took a couple of weeks off and now, uh, you know, we're talking aggravation and mitigation. You know the case. What do you expect to be the high points for each side? Well, I think the high point for the government will be <clears throat> You have to focus on premeditation, premeditation, premeditation. This just it just wasn't a whim. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a lark. Uh, the defendant, Grant Amato, planned it out. He wanted money. He was angry at his parents. They were trying to rein him in a little bit, especially the father. He had this love interest by Cam, uh, whatever that was. And it was cold, calculated, and based on anger and greed. And they're going to focus on that. If I were the defense, I would focus on how he's sort of a submissive person. He's not He's not an aggressive guy. They just called this uh, lieutenant from the correctional facility to say he was a model prisoner. He's sort of a meek and mild guy, even though he has been found guilty of uh, all, the, all three murders. But I would focus on that because a jury wants to take the life of someone who is a cold-blooded killer, period. Uh, a Ted Bundy, a serial killer. Uh, there, if I were to defense, I would try to say he's everything but, and he has a lot of psychological issues that make him not worthy of the death penalty. Those are the things I would focus on for each side. Now we're going to find All out. Right. We're going to find out how close you were to that because we're going to replay some of the prosecution opening. Before we do that, let me plant this seed for you. Under Florida law, you can look this up, Gene. 921.141 sub six. Uh, lays out the 16 factors for aggravating circumstances. I'll talk about what I think are the most important ones and get your take on that. But let's go now again to uh, some of the opening statement from the prosecution in this penalty phase. So a lot of this opening statement seemed to be more a uh, coming attractions. Gene Rossi it was more like, hey, uh, wait for my closing argument. Then I'm going to cover things like the, uh, the burden that the prosecution has to meet and, and all of these other things that you'll deal with when you make your your decision in deliberating this man's future. Uh, how do you like that? Instead of really laying out the case, he said, I'm going to tell you about it in my closing. I, I liked it, and I'll tell you why. It was not a fire and brimstone opening of the penalty phase. That's good. You don't want to come across as deranged and vengeful as a prosecutor. That will turn off the jury. He embraced, he embraced that it will be a hard issue for them. It's not an easy question. So he's teamed that up. But he's focusing on a heightened level of premeditation, and that's exactly what where they Where did he hear that, Gene? Where, where must he have heard that? I, I don't know. Was... You know, some brilliant <laughs> lawyer said it about an hour ago, ah, okay. but, but I got to tell you this. They're never going to get the death penalty if they can't persuade the jury that this wasn't just premeditation. This was premeditation on steroids. Hmm. And if they, if they prove that, um, I think they have a chance at the death penalty. Okay, Gene, on the stand now, a guy you might recognize, this is uh, Chris Sisko. He uh, has some background information on Grant Amato. He was on earlier. Now he's on in rebuttal for a specific purpose. Let's listen in. Okay, so important note here, the jury not in the room for this voir dire of this, this witness. This is a friend of Cody Amato, who was killed by Grant Amato when he also killed his parents under the underlying crimes here, where the penalty phase. So this guy was going to be, and may still, 
get back on the stand as a rebuttal witness to testify as he just testified now to the judge. And he's basically trying to convince the judge, as is the uh, prosecutor who wants to put him on, that he has something relevant to bring to this situation. The defense attacking it, saying, you know, where, where'd you first come up with this story that, uh, you know, Grant Amato was fired for some sort of cause? Remember, Gene Rossi, uh, the jury didn't learn about his sh shenanigans there at, uh, at the nursing facility where he was uh, borrowing propofol uh, and all those other things that led to his termination. The jury didn't hear about that. So kind of dangerous if we get into that 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 issue of his termination isn't it yes and i'm glad i'm glad you told me michael that this was a voir dire and it wasn't in the presence of the jury because if it were that would be a horrible cross but i now understand why the defense attorney was asking these questions the punchline i got out of this cross exam is that almost everything this witness knows about these incidences that led to the dismissal is pure categorical hearsay, hearsay. Yes. Word, of, yes. word of mouth word of mouth it's gossip yeah and and you combine that with the fact that they were already instructed before this trial that you're not getting into the whole reason he was terminated from his nursing job which relates to the propofol and then he had subsequent depression and all of that kind of snowballed into the the confrontation between his dad who said hey you got to stop it with the russian you know miss ventsislavova she's off the table now all of that, you know, began with his losing his job. But the jury doesn't know that stuff. So this witness, if this witness does testify, highly unlikely they're going to be able to get into any of, uh, of that stuff. Bryant with you. There is the judge on the bench in Florida versus Grant Amato. When we left, the guy who is now taking the stand again, Chris Sisko, was being brought in by the judge and the attorneys to find out if what he had to offer in this penalty phase was worth the effort. There was a lot of hearsay talked about Gene Rossi. You don't like this decision, do you? I, I don't. Here's why. In a sentencing, for the, for the uh, viewers, in a sentencing, you can use hearsay. But, Michael, this is such rank, disgusting hearsay. It, it has no basis. She could have made a ruling that it's unduly prejudicial, especially in a death penalty case. My goodness. So let's see. She said under the statute it's okay, so let's go hear what he has to say. So Judge Jessica Rexidler may have just given somebody another uh, uh, appellate issue. Well, who knows? Depends on what happens in the penalty phase here. What was going on there was the uh, Chris Sisko, the witness, was in the nursing program with, remember, both Cody, the deceased brother, and Grant, the defendant, were in, the, in the nursing, and they were all going to school together. So, obviously, Chris, upset that his friend Cody was taken out by Grant, and now is offered to this jury what is some sort of aggravating um, factor in determining whether they should recommend, this jury should recommend death as the punishment for Grant Amato. Gene Rossi, former federal prosecutor, let's take a step back. Let's assume all of that's true. Let's assume it wasn't hearsay upon hearsay, rumor upon rumor. And that was true, that he got terminated from this nursing program because he didn't cover shifts that he was supposed to cover. Big deal? When you're talking Not about murder and penalties for murder? I got to tell you, the prosecutors are really grabbing for straws. He was AWOL. He was lazy. He was a malcontent. They got rid of him. He's, a, he's an employee that was not very good. Does that mean you have to take his life? I would tell you, I tell you, Michael, I would make hay with that if I were in a closing argument for the defense, because that, that to me is, uh, is grabbing for straws. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it seems to me they have so much more to work with. You know, I'm looking at these factors, and I mentioned the code section, and there are 16 aggravating factors. I focused on two, which I think are most important. Number six is financial gain. I'd be pounding away on that like crazy. And yes. number eight is if the act was heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Now, if you don't know what those words mean, the statute has done their best to uh, describe them. Heinous is extremely wicked, shockingly evil. Atrocious is outrageously wicked and vile. And cruel is a high, uh, a high level of pain with utter indifference or even enjoyment at the suffering of others. That's the stuff I'd be hitting, Gene Rossi. Absolutely. And in my closing, I'd hold up that list you just talked about, and I'd say as a defense attorney, members of the jury, where in this list of 16 factors does it say he's a lazy and incompetent person in a nursing class? Where does it say that? 
And, and I would make hay with that. That was a stupid call by the prosecution. Stupid. Maybe, maybe a little tunnel vision there, not quite seeing the big picture like those of us outside the, uh, the building are. Okay, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back again. This is the uh, Amato trial and the uh, penalty phase. Will the jury recommend death or life without the possibility of parole? Coming right back to the Law and Crime Network. So there's an interesting take by the defense in their opening on, on what is a passion-based crime, which would somehow mitigate against the death penalty in this case. Gene Rossi, before we get to that, you know, I looked at the mitigating factors as well under the statute, and the key ones, in my opinion, are no significant history of criminal activity, uh, defendant under extreme mental or emotional disturbance, maybe, and uh, six, basically an, uh, an insanity type presentation, that he's not right in the head, so you don't want to kill this person. What do you think of the defense opening there? I thought that was excellent. Crimes of passion are not premeditation, and that's what they have to argue. I would have put a little more evidence on in the penalty phase on how he was addicted, how he was obsessed with this person. It wasn't that he wanted to kill his parents. He just had this passion for someone who really didn't exist, only his, in his mind. So I would have pounded that a little more, but I thought it was a good job. Whether it's going to save his life, we shall see. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a tough argument because he's basically equating a, uh, a, a, a heat of passion, snapped type defense to this defendant. And we think of that more in terms of, uh, you know, walking in on your wife or husband with a significant other other and you just lose it and you kill them. That's more the passion we hear about. In this case, he's suggesting that this defendant, Grand Amato, was so passionate over his Bulgarian girlfriend and the loss of his connection to her that he took it out on his parents and his brother. That's a, kind of a reach. It's, it's the best. Michael, it's like poker. You're dealt a hand. That is the best card they can play. And I thought the defense attorney did the best he could. And you have to remember, of course, uh, only one person has to say no to the death penalty, and he's, uh, he's going away for life. So, uh, you know, obviously a lot of folks are impacted by these murders. Cody Amato, the brother of Grant Amato, was one of the victims. And one of the people affected by Cody's death, certainly his girlfriend, Sloan Young, she spoke to the court earlier. Well, overwhelming probably doesn't even start to uh, explain how this guy feels. Jason Amato, his brother, on trial for the murder of the rest of his family. Gene Rossi, you know, it's interesting with these victim impact statements. Uh, in the Florida statutes, they aren't part of the aggravating factor analysis, but, uh, I mean, come on, the jurors, for the most part, are human beings. What's going yeah. to weigh more on them? This kind of testimony or some sort of, you know, aggravation of the kind we heard just before this from the, uh, the guy in the school? I think aggravation of the, the former uh, that you just talked about. I, I do want to say one thing. When Jason was testifying, Jason Amato was testifying, I'll guarantee you every one of those jurors was looking at the demeanor of Grant Amato. And when I saw clips of Grant Amato while his brother was testifying just now, I didn't see any emotion. I saw nothing. It was vacant. And I think that, as much as anything, is going to hurt him if they decide to take his life. Yeah, you there was know, no emotion. I, we've been watching that all along as the trial unfolded in the guilt phase, now in the penalty phase, zero emotion. You might as well just have told this guy, hey, you got to wait another couple of minutes for your uh, Big Mac, okay? I mean, he has no emotion about anything as dramatic or as, uh, as horrendous as the testimony has been about him. Right. And that kind of hurts their argument that this was a, this was a, a crime of passion, you know, uh, a spontaneous act. It wasn't premeditated. He had the demeanor sitting at that table of someone who very easily engaged in premeditation for days and weeks before he took the lives of three people, his brother and his parents. Yeah, you know, this guy was in the anesthesiology business, but I think he had a passionectomy because he has, it doesn't seem to have any interest in much of anything. Uh, okay, Gene, we're going to talk more about this. We're going to take a quick break. Just a couple of reminders here real quick, like the Eric Boyd jury uh, deliberating. They have the case, been with it about an hour and a half, and we are going to come back to this Grand Amato matter. We expect closing arguments in the penalty phase very soon. I'll keep an eye on the clock. We'll come back to that case in just a moment. So they got past all the fireworks there and the emotion uh, 
for a mistrial, which was denied by the judge. And now they're really just doing the what, what's called the instruction conference. Should we put this instruction in? Should we keep this one out? Does this one apply? All the, you know, the attorneys have to agree uh, on the substance of those instructions before they're given to the jury. Gene Rossi, although this is housekeeping at its finest, pretty important stuff. Oh, absolutely. Michael, I had a, a big case, a doctor, pain doctor, uh, conviction and then uh, well after we rested we had a jury conference and I fought for an instruction on willfulness uh, it was given the judge agreed with me went to the Fourth Circuit US Court of Appeals reversal so these conferences are very important whether you use a certain phrase a certain word crucial especially in a death penalty case yeah grounds for appeal quite often involve the jury instruction so that yeah. is critical stuff let me ask your uh, opinion quickly here on the verdict form uh, apparently there's a supreme court case recently in 2018 this judge is relying on that says you can put the aggravating factors on the verdict form on the jury form on the questionnaire <laughs> but you can't or don't need to put the mitigating factors on there and the defense had an issue with that what do you think what that Supreme Court uh, case said was, as long as you list the aggravated and mitigating in the core of the instructions, you don't have to repeat them again on the verdict form. That's all it said. And a judge has discretion not to put them on the verdict form. So what do you think? I mean, fundamental fairness? It just seems, what's the harm of putting them on there? There is no harm. And I don't want to be a judge. I'll never be a judge. But I don't see why a judge just doesn't err on the side of caution and just put them in there. You eliminate entirely an appellate issue. But she decided not to. So let's, uh, let's back up and talk about what's going on now, where we're going to go with this case and the jury's uh, job. How do you feel the prosecution did in trying to convince every one of these folks, got to be unanimous, that Grand Amato should be given the death penalty? I think overall, I think the prosecution did do a good job because there, there was nothing in the penalty phase that was put forth by either side that even had a semblance of justification for keeping him alive. Did they call a friend from when he was 10 years old, 15, a friend he knew his whole life? Did they call a former mentor, a basketball coach, a teacher? They didn't call anybody that said he was a good kid. I mean, my goodness gracious. So yeah. I think the prosecution did a good job. I don't know about the defense. I, yeah. I, I don't know. Hey, I well, don't know. You know, you mentioned that, and we saw at the end of the case in chief for the, for the state, they rested, and the defense said, you know, we're good. We're all right here. Uh, I mean, that's hanging it out there, isn't it? Oh, my God. I, I've seen cases that involve no violence at all, and at the sentencing, it's like a line of people saying the defendant's a great guy. Um, I'm having a sentencing in December of a drug dealer. I already, I, I already said I'm gonna, I'm gonna have family there. I'm gonna have letters. I mean, this is the death penalty. This is the Super Bowl of sentencings, for goodness sakes. You know, you can't try, treat it like an intramural game. And, you, you know, if you look at the mitigating factors, and I've only highlighted a few, but the very first one is no significant history of criminal activity. I don't know that there was evidence of any criminal activity because the whole propofol thing from his nursing gig was excluded from the trial. So couldn't they have piled on there and just said this guy's been an upstanding citizen? It helps support the idea that he snapped and had this passionate response to the, uh, you know, the refusal to let him see his uh, Bulgarian girlfriend. I mean, it, those seem to be pretty basic things. I would have played up that cam girl thing. I didn't brace it and say, listen, this guy had a lonely life. He was miserable. And he fell in love with this thing on a camcorder. And he, and, he, and he went for it hook, line, and sinker. It was a crime of passion. It wasn't a crime of hate. Yeah. And that's what I would have argued. We didn't see any of that, Gene, so we'll see what the, uh, the jury gets to do with this. Uh, again, closing arguments coming up. This is the Law & Crime Network. We're going to be right back to Florida for the Grant Amato wrapping up and still in verdict watch in the Eric Boyd case out of Tennessee. They're now coming up on about two hours they've had the case. Come right back.